I'm going to continue talking about patient selection for presbyopic refractive surgery, maybe in a little bit different approach. Let's first look at what is functional vision. Functional vision is the ability to see clearly while performing daily activities in varying levels of light. So this really means that Snellen does not take into account the real world situations of low contrast and low light. So loss of functional visual acuity, even with good Snellen acuity, can decrease quality of life and compromise, for example, driving safety. So how do we see? How we see involves a complex interaction of optical and image processing pathways within the visual system from the cornea to the cortex. Image quality depends on input received through the eye and on processing in the visual cortex. We have made impressive improvements of treating presbyopia. Let's be very clear about that. But it is elusive to try to simulate natural vision. So what we're doing now is to move away from supervision to functional vision or physiological vision or an even better word might be environmental vision. In the healthy eye, we all know that accommodation is aided by an increased depth of focus through uncorrected astigmatism, longitudinal chromatic aberrations, monochromatic high order ocular aberrations, such as spherical aberrations and coma. So, age 50 and zero accommodation, but can still achieve some amount of functional vision, how does that come about? That is due to age-related changes in pupil size, which is decreased, plus spherical aberration, which is increased due to changes in the shape of the crystalline lens. So the crucial question is, what should the refraction be for achieving optimal visual functionality? So it is clear that supervision should not be the ultimate correction anymore. In daily life, mid-distance vision and reading becomes more important with aging, that is, about the age of 50. So the hypothetical eye with supervision optics will have such a small depth of focus that even a mid-distance target will require an accommodative response in order to achieve optimal retinal image. Natural vision is related to a great degree to the environment in which we are living and working. So I'd like to share with you the environmental parameters that we have devised in our clinic. If you work for a distance of 30 to 50 centimeters, what should we do with that patient? Distance 50 to 100 centimeters, what should we do with that patient? And so forth. And the list could be made much, much longer than this, but I think this is a very nice scheme to work out from to do start to decide the option of surgery that will be taken. So it is of utmost importance that we suggest to our patients that probably the best vision is not supervision, but functional or physiological vision. Customize the best overall solution for each patient. Thank you very much.
Attends, ça attends, attends, attends. Mmh. On passe les personnes suivantes Non, non, c'est toujours le même. Ah, c'est toujours le même. Ouais, tout 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 So I continue now with my next lecture and I must give a special thanks to Liliana Warner who contributed with some of these slides. And why the title Presbyopic Refractor Surgery 2004 and 2009? The fairy tale continues. This is actually a presentation done in 2004. It's fairly obvious that we have seen changing demographics all over the world. In my country, Sweden, people get older and older and require more and more help, both for reading and for what have you not. The benefits of, for example, multifocal IOX are that unlike multifocal contact lenses, the IOL is positioned extremely close to the eye, nodal point, and it can be well positioned with little to no movement and do not suffer from protein or other debris accumulation on the lens. The disadvantages of multifocal lenses are huge. We have an image degradation from loss in contrast sensitivity. This is due to one image being in focus, juxtaposed against an out of focus background image. Further similar to our experiences with multifocal contact lenses, the image in focus is then more readily compromised by astigmatism, lens tilt, capsular opacities, pupil dilation and subclinical cystoid macular edema. In addition, different, in addition, diffractive optics may be associated with more chromatic aberration, astigmatism and coma than monofocal intraocular lenses. We talked about this before, patient selection is one of the keys to success. The patient, as has been stated before, must be able to adopt to glare and halos. These are common even with conventional IOLs. There are slightly higher levels with microfocal IOLs and making your patient aware before surgery of the possibility for glare and halos minimizes the shock factor should they in fact notice them. It has been demonstrated a binocular summation effect with quality of vision studies showing improved patient comfort once the second eye is implanted. Immediate post-operative healing and the effect of visual acuity is, I don't think it worked. You will hear that ever so often, but you have to tell the patient here, be patient because this is a healing process. <coughs> it's a process that also involves your brain. What cannot be emphasized enough in these patients is the ocular surface. The ocular surface disease or the syndrome or a dry eye <coughs> is certainly having a great, great impact on vision with either multifocal lenses or if you do a corneal ablation procedure. The pulse of patient selection, patient psychology, low concern for perfect contrast vision, slight tolerance for unwanted visual phenomena such as halos, good personality, those who desire perfect distance vision are less suitable, pupil size matters, and one week between the two surgeries. We've talked about presbyopia before, and 
I will just give you some examples of what we can do to correct the cornea mm -hmm. for observed dual accommodation. We can use HR's astigmatism, Cernica vertical coma, Cernica aspheric aberrations, like prolate cornea, all these will increase the depth of focus. Or we could do a multifocal cornea. Others are like hyperpositive intracorneal implants or pinhole inlays. The examples of intraocular observed accommodative lenses are multifocal IOLs, high, OIL, high IOL aspiricity, IOL axial meridian displacement, and maybe there are others. This list, made five years ago, still holds very well. And I'm not going to go through it in detail, just to have some small comments on scleral ciliary surgery. We are not using that anymore. Uh, the results have been controversial. And if you try to get hold of some results out in the world, it's almost impossible to get hold of them. Corneal excimer laser surgery, certainly probably the most exciting of uh, the laser or corneal ablation procedures because you can create so much with it. The results so far are a little bit contradictory. We are inducing corneal aberrations and we are claiming to restore up to one and a half the optical amplitude of accommodation with that one. The techniques, the one that I prefer is the Chobar technique with a super, super prolate cornea. We, V6 have an aspherical treatment designed uh, which seems to work fairly well. And moving on to the corneal inlays, while we are on the cornea, we need a laser cut and a corneal inlay placement. There are very few results reported on this and what it does really do is to increase the depth of focus, nothing else. However, uh, from uh, the experience in Alicante uh, were that a lot of these inlays were uh, taken out, or removed, because uh, they did not work or cosmetic reasons, because you will see this inlay on the cornea. I will move on now to uh, uh, intraocular multifocal lenses. And the aim here is of course to mimic accommodation through lens multifocality, whether it's diffractive, refractive or hybrid. So we have a lot to choose from there. And with the results here, they claim to restore up to about two and a half diopters of amplitude of accommodation. It's doubtful, however. We have a, a big choice of lenses. This is the multifocal, refracted from Array and AMO. We have the Acritech from uh, Twinset, Germany. And we have the Acrisoft Restore, which is not really a true multifocal. I would rather call it a bifocal lens. We have the Technis Z Zoom lens, which is a diffractive lens. And we have the Resume, also from AMO, which is a refractive lens. So the intraocular lenses that are positional and accommodative here. Yeah. Again, we are trying to restore accommodation. But it requires an active ciliary muscle, elastic lens capsule, and the vitreous plays a certain role. Again, about 1.25 diopters of amplitude of accommodation can be restored. Examples is the crystalline layer, crystal lens, human optics, Smart foil lenses, they are looking into this in the United States and this could be something for the future. The results 
are very, very strange at the moment, but it is dependent on a very interesting factor, namely the body temperature. And it could mean that uh, this lens, the smart IOL, might be something for the future, but as I said, we are still in the beginning of the trials with this one. The injectable lenses we have not seen too much about, uh, of so far, where you inject a silicone uh, polymer into the bag, and uh, this was published by uh, Nishi in 2008, and we're still waiting for his results to be more, or that will be more results on this uh, interesting lens. What is even more interesting is the light adjustable lens that I like to spend just a little bit of time on. This lens is a multifocal lens. You can perform your natural procedure when it comes to cataract extraction or lens procedure, whatever you like. You and you don't need to worry too much if you missed out a little bit on the power because the power of this lens can be adjusted by exposing it to UV radiation. That is to say that I, first of all, can adjust the spherical power and the cylindrical power. When I've done that, I let the lens rest in the eye for a week or so. After that, we can redo it before we are locking the position and I can contrast something like uh, the restore lens configuration uh, to achieve uh, reading abilities. And this certainly uh, is a, a great, great challenge and it's very, very exciting and we've been working with it now for two years. So changing the anterior surface with the accommodating lens, new lens, we've been waiting for this lens for many years now. Uh, it's been rumored around five years and we're still hoping to see some results of it. However, it claims to be able to uh, restore about eight diopters or even more of accommodation. <coughs> we have the Aqua lens. That's also an accommodating lens from uh, Breda in uh, Holland. Uh, also very, very interesting concept where the lens is sliding, where you have the elements sliding over each other and by that changing the power of the lens. And this could be a very, very exciting and thrilling thing to work on as well. Work is uh, still going on with rabbit eyes on this one. Synchrony lens, we don't know too much about from this again in Irvine. It's a one-piece silicone lens and we hope to hear more about it in due time. So, the concern with the dual optic mm -hmm. lenses on all of them is the interlenticular opacification. And Liliana Warner has written a paper published about this in American Journal of Ophthalmology as early as 2002. And the investigations of these, this occurrence, of this opacification, is still ongoing. 